Okay, then I think we are ready to start. So, hello everyone. Welcome to the tutorial, Mining of Real World Hypergraphs, Concepts, Patterns, and Generators. And I'm Gon Lee from KAIST in South Korea. Um, and I'm the first presenter. And Jamin Yu is the second presenter of this tutorial. He is a postdoc researcher at CMU. And Ki Jung Shin is our last presenter. And he's um, from KAIST as well. So in the first part of this tutorial, we will discuss some motivations and some backgrounds and some concepts of hypergraphs. And yeah, so let's get started with some intuitive examples. So as you can see in these figures, our question is, in real world scenarios, how do we interact with others? And let's first think of publishing a paper. So um, we often co-work as a group with lab members, advisors, or colleagues, and such collaboration of set or a group of multiple researchers can be any size, which means that any numbers of researchers, including only two, can co-work together and form a group. So for example, these are the three papers, um, one of the three papers that will be introduced in this tutorial, and you can see that um, each paper is co-authored by different numbers of people. And we also communicate as a group in online chatting platforms such as WhatsApp or iMessage. And we usually belong to different chat rooms consisting of groups of various people. And the groups can be um, our friends, family members, or um, project teams. And we can also think of um, buying a set of items in offline or in online. So in online case, we can think of like um, e-commerce websites like Amazon. And in this case, we add multiple items to our shopping cart and order them at once. So in this case, we don't like put random items to our shopping cart, right? So um, such set of items can be considered as a group relations that implicitly um, um, related, related to each other. And similar example can be found in like online Q&A sites like Stack Overflow. Um, so in this case, um, text in this red box are attached to a single question. So we can say that these tags are indirectly related to each other. So we can think such set of tags as a group relation. So we have just seen some intuitive examples of group interactions that arise in many areas in our lives. And such group interactions among individuals or objects can be modeled as a hypergraph. And the hypergraph is a set of hyper edges where each hyper edge is a subset of any numbers of nodes. So each hyper edge indicates a group interaction among its members. So let's see an example on, in this figure. So here we are given nine authors and four publications that are co-authored by some of the authors. And this collaboration can be modeled as a hypergraph on the right hand side, where each node is an author and each hyper edge is a publication that was co authored by some of the authors. So, for example, the first hyper edge E1 here represents the KDD paper here, which was published in 2005 by Yure Deskobek, John Kleinberg, and Christos Palosos. And this paper is actually about densification densification loads of real world graphs. And also notice that um, the sizes of the hyper edges can be any size. So for example, the hyper edge E3 is size four and the other hyper edges are size three. Then why do we have to use hypergraphs to model group information? And this question can be rephrased into why don't we use graphs? Because graphs have been a prominent research area for decades. And we can easily find the reason of this question from simple example. So on the left-hand side figure, let's consider a group of co-authors of three publishing a single paper. Then how can model this group interaction as a graph? And what people um, usually have done is to connect every pair in the group as an edge and make a click or a fully connected graph. So in this case, um, the three authors will be um, constructed as a triangle or a fully connected graph of three nodes. But this simple reduction into pairwise relations loses group information. So this means that from the graph on the right-hand side, 
we are not sure whether there was a group interaction of the three authors. And instead, every pair of the nodes in the graph may have um, published three independent papers. So this means that from the graph in the right hand side, um, the group information is lost, which means that um, we can say that there is an information loss, like um, group information or higher order information during the transformation into pairwise graphs. And from the previous examples, we have just discussed the inherent limitations of pairwise graphs. And um, from that, we found the reason to use hypergraphs to model group information. But hypergraphs are not only conceptually beneficial, but they have been proven to be very powerful in various applications, such as classification, ranking, link prediction, and anomaly detection. And in this work, it has been demonstrated that serving these kinds of tasks by modeling as a hypergraph improves the performance compared to modeling as a pairwise graph. And also there is a journal paper that comprehensively compares different modeling methods like graphs or hypergraphs. So we recommend you to um, have a look at this paper if you're interested. Okay, and some of you might think that group interactions can also be represented as a bipartite graph as in the left-hand left -hand side figure. So in this case, one side of the nodes are the nodes in the hypergraph and the other side of the nodes will be the hyper edges of the hypergraph. And in this way, we can represent the group interactions without losing any information. But modeling um, group information as a hypergraph poses new questions that are overlooked for graphs. And specifically, hypergraphs is a set of sets. And from this fact, we can analyze the data in a new perspective. And this is what we are going to cover in this tutorial. And the good news is that there are many real world hypergraph data set uh, that are um, open for public. And um, there are uh, many hypergraphs from different domains, including the examples that we covered in the previous slides. And the other examples can be, for example, an email, a set of email addresses that um, received a single email can be modeled as a set of um, hyper edge. And for case of the drugs, a set of substances that makes up the drug can be modeled as a hyper edge. And yeah, this will be uh, yeah, hypergraph as well. So these are the basic statistics of the data sets of hypergraphs. And we can see that there are various um, hypergraphs with different numbers of nodes and hyper edges. And basically these data sets, hypergraphs are given with temporal information, which means that the timestamp that each hyper edge arrived is given. But for static analysis, we can just ignore these temporal information and yeah, use for static analysis as well. So these are some of the other data sets for, uh, that are released. And another good thing, good news is that uh, many open source software for mining hypergraphs and generating hypergraphs are open. So yeah, so these are the GitHub links um, to the models that will be covered in this tutorial. Okay, so in this tutorial, we will cover three parts. Um, so the first two parts will be about structural patterns of real world hypergraphs. And specifically, we will cover static patterns in the first part and dynamic patterns in the second part. And in the last part, we will discuss some generative models of hypergraphs. Um, and these generative models um, aim to generate some synthetic hypergraphs that preserves the structural properties that we discussed in part one and two. So I will cover the static structure pattern, pattern one, and Jamin will cover part two, and Gijong will um, discuss part three. So the outline of part one and two, which is about structural patterns in hypergraphs, is as in the table. So um, 12 static patterns and nine dynamic patterns will be covered respectively. And for each part, we divide the patterns based on the level of the structure. So basically um, the node hyper edge hypergraph level patterns will be basic patterns and sub hypergraph level patterns will be advanced patterns. And in part three, which will be about generative models of hypergraphs, uh, we divided the models into um, those that generate static hypergraph or dynamic hypergraph. 
and um, the models can be even divided based on whether they generate the full entire hypergraph or sub hypergraph. Okay, then um, why are these important? Um, structural patterns are crucial for understanding and utilizing hypergraph structure data. And this can be used in various applications, for example, and prediction by analyzing how the hypergraph evolve over time, then we can predict the future group inter interaction. And in anomaly detection, if the pattern of some nodes or hyper edges do not follow the patterns that are commonly observed in real world hypergraphs, then we can suspect those nodes or hyper edges as anomalies. And when we design some algorithms for, for hypergraphs, we can incorporate um, some structural properties that we find in real world hypergraphs uh, for more fa fast and efficient algorithms. So just to recap, um, the first part of this tutorial will be about static structure patterns. And yeah, so it'll be divided into basic and advanced patterns. And in the second part, uh, we will discuss how real world temporal or dynamic hypergraphs are structured. So the definition of temporal hypergraph is a set of temporal hyper edges. So each temporal hyper edge is given a timestamp it arrives. So yeah, so by definition, um, each temporal hyper edge is a pair of set of nodes and the timestamp it appeared. So one thing that is different from the static hypergraph is that um, temporal hyper edges consisting of exactly the same set of nodes can appear at different timestamps. So in this part, we want to answer to the questions, how do real world hypergraphs evolve over time? And given a dynamic hypergraph, how can we analyze its structure? And in the last part of this tutorial, we will share some generative models of hypergraphs that preserve the um, structural properties that were observed in part one and two. And first we will introduce models that generate static hypergraphs. And then we will um, discuss some dynamic hypergraph generative models. And most importantly, these models can explain why uh, the patterns that we discussed in part one and two are observed by providing some potential underlying mechanisms of them. And um, one another advantage of um, designing generative models is that um, they can be used for various purposes. So for example, we can anonymize the hypergraph data with sensitive information by creating a similar but synthetic hypergraph or we can use for simulating our hypergraph algorithms in a small but very representative hyper sub hypergraph. So this was the introduction of this tutorial. Um, you can uh, find our slides and references to the papers that we discussed in this tutorial and hyperlinks to useful materials in our tutorial website. Okay, so. These are the references to the papers that I discussed in this part. And these are the references to the open source softwares. Okay, so are there any questions? Or otherwise, I think we can move on to the second part. Okay, I think yep, we are ready to get started with the second part of the tutorial. Okay, so okay. Hmm. Good. So here um, in this part, we want to answer to the questions, what do real world hypergraphs look like? And given a static hypergraph, how can we analyze the structure? And first we will cover some basic static patterns in real world hypergraphs. And in this sub part, um, we will share eight patterns from three different levels, node, hyper edge, and hypergraph level patterns. And before moving on, let's review some basic concepts in hypergraphs. So in this figure, we are given a hypergraph with eight nodes and four hyper edges. And the degree of a node is defined as the number of hyper edges that contains the node. So for example, 
um, the degree of node V5 in the figure um, is two because there are two hyper edges E2 and E3 that contains the node V5. And the size of a hyper edge E is the number of the nodes that contains the, um, that is contained in the hyper edge. So for example, the size of the hyper edge E2 is three. And the next terminology is an instance matrix of a hypergraph. And an instance matrix is a matrix formulation of the structure of the hypergraph. So it is a basically a binary matrix that consists of either zero or one. And the rows represent the nodes and the columns represent the hyper edges. And the value of each element is one if and only if, if the node, the corresponding node is included in the corresponding hyper edge. So for example, um, since node V5 is contained in uh, hyper edge E3, the corresponding element will be one and otherwise it will be all zeros. So basically, typically the, the instance matrix is very sparse matrix. And in graphs, we often represent the structure as an in adjacent matrix where both rows and columns are nodes. But in hypergraphs, since hyper edges can be any sized, we cannot accurately formulate the hypergraph structure as an adjacent matrix. So typically in hypergraph, we model the structure as an instance matrix. Okay, so now that we have reviewed some backgrounds, let's move on to our first um, four basic static patterns. And these patterns were um, discussed in ICDM 2020 paper. And this was selected as one of the best papers in this conference. And um, it, this, in this paper, um, they tried, the authors tried to answer to simple and intuitive questions about the hypergraph structure. So for example, the question can be, how many groups does a person belong to? And we can answer to this question by observing the degree distributions of hypergraphs. So as seen in these figures, no degree distributions of real-world hypergraphs follow power law distribution. And we can see that um, they are all heavy-tailed. So this can be partially explained by the rich get richer property. So high degree nodes are more likely to form groups in the future. And the second question can be how many people are in each group? And we can answer to this question by observing the size distribution of the hypergraph. And we can see in these figures that the distributions are also heavy tailed as in node degree distribution. And this means that the popular groups gets more popular in the future. Then how many people belong to two groups at the same time? And this question, instead of the, uh, observing the size distributions of individual hyper edges, this means how large is the intersection sizes of two hyper edges. And this also has been observed to be heavy tailored power load distributions, as we can see in these figures. And the last observation is the singular value distributions of an instance matrix. So um, since instance matrix um, formulates the entire structure of the hypergraph, we can regard these um, observation as a hypergraph level pattern. And we can see that the distributions are skewed and heavy tailed. And yeah. So next, let's see some two more basic static patterns in real world hypergraphs. And these patterns were discussed in the web conference last year. So here, instead of investigating the degree distributions of individual nodes, we want to see how pair or tree proof nodes and together form hyper edges. So um, as we can see in this figure, the degree of pair or tree proof nodes is defined as the number of hyper edges that overlaps the pair or triple. So for example, in this figure, uh, the degree of a pair of nodes V3 and V5 is three because there are three hyper edges E2, E3, and E4 that contains these two nodes at the same time. And similarly, the degree of a tree proof nodes V3, V5, and V6 will be two. And the degree of a pair or tree proof nodes can be also interpreted as the structural similarity between the two nodes or three nodes because intuitively nodes are structurally more similar if they are contained in more um, hyper edges together. So examining the degree distributions of pairs or tree proof nodes instead of that of individual nodes gives higher order insights of how nodes as a set form hyper edges. And in the slides, we are given two distributions of um, degree distributions of pairs and tree proofs of nodes on the left and right respectively. 
and we compare the distributions of real world hypergraphs and random hypergraphs, which are colored in green and red. And we can see that the degree distributions of pair or trip proof nodes in real world hypergraphs are more skewed and it has a heavier tail than com um, compared to random hypergraphs. Um, and we can um, find that these results are quite intuitive because the more often a pair or trip proof nodes interact together, the more likely they are to interact together again. So, for example, researchers that have co authored multiple papers um, are likely to share common interests. And this can lead to more collaborations in the future. Okay, then next, let's see a hyper edge level pattern. So here, our question is how are how nodes that form a hyper edge together are related to each other. So in real world hypergraphs, um, it is very unlikely that the hyper edge is consisted of randomly chosen nodes. And instead, we can expect that there are strong dependency between the nodes in the single hyper edge. So to quantify this, the hyper edge homogeneity is defined as the average numbers of hyper edges that overlaps at all the pairs of nodes in the hyper edge. So as we discussed earlier, the more hyper edges a pair of nodes share, the more structurally similar the, the pair of nodes are. So the hyper edge homogeneity is the average of the uh, number of pairs, uh, number of hyper edges that pairs of nodes share. So this measures how the nodes in the hyper edges, uh, in the hyper edge, are structurally similar to each other. And of course, this equation can be um, extended to like three or four nodes. So in this slide, we can see three different distributions from three different data sets, and it is the distributions of hyper edge homogeneity. Um, we compare with real world hypergraph and random hypergraphs, and we can see that hyper edges in real world hypergraphs tend to have higher homogeneity compared to random hypergraphs. This means that hyper edges in um, real world hypergraphs um, contain structurally similar nodes compared to those in random hypergraphs. Okay, so let's move on to five more basic static patterns, and these patterns were discovered in. KD 2020. So in this paper, the authors tried to think of a way to use graph mining tools to analyze hypergraph structure. And this is because um, hypergraph is, has more complicated structure. Specifically, it, has, it incorporates some kind of group information that ordinary graphs cannot. And another motivation is that there are more tools for mining graphs than hypergraphs. So if we can transform the hypergraph into a pairwise graph, then we can adopt various properties or tools that have been studied for graphs for decades. And a simple approach to transform the hypergraph into a pairwise graph is called click expansion. Um, and this is actually what we discussed in the introduction section. So um, click expansion is to make each hyper edge as a click. So, um, it connects every pair of the nodes in each hyper edge as an edge, pairwise edge. But the problem of this approach was that um, it causes information loss, which means that the higher order information in the hypergraph is lost. So we cannot recover the group information from the pairwise graphs, um, from yeah, to the yeah, pairwise graphs. So to address this problem, the authors devised a multi-level decomposition of a hypergraph. So instead of decomposing a hypergraph into a node-level graph, the idea is to consider pairwise relations between subsets of nodes. So in the k-level decomposition of a hypergraph, each node is a subset of k nodes, and uh, k nodes that um, has ever shared the hyper edge, and an edge between the two nodes are formed if the union of the two subsets have shared any hyper edge. So for example, um, if we see a hyper edge in the red square in the left-hand side hypergraph um, that consists of node one, two, and three, and four, um, this can be decomposed into multiple subsets of nodes. So if K is one, then it is decomposed into four individual nodes. And if K is two, then six nodes where each node is a subset of two nodes are generated. And if K is three, then four nodes will be generated. So the K level decomposed graph naturally represents how each set of K nodes interacts with other set of K nodes. 
So using um, these decomposed graphs, we can utilize existing measures and tools for graph analysis. And another advantage of multi-level decomposition is that there is no information loss, which means that from the decomposed graphs on the right-hand side, we can fully recover the group information of the hypergraph. And you can find the proof in the paper. So the first observation using the multi-level decomposition is that at every decomposition level, the degree distributions are heavy tailed. So this means that rich get richer tendency is observed not only in node level um, decomposed graphs, but also in subset of node levels. So high degree subsets are more likely to interact with other subsets of um, nodes. And the next property is that at every decomposition level, the singular value distributions, uh, which is computed by the, the adjacent metrics of the decomposed graphs are heavy tailed and um, the distributions are skewed. So this is very similar results that we found by um, computing the singular values by instance metrics. And next, we can observe that the composed graphs have a giant connected component, which is one of the properties that have been observed in real world graphs. So this means that there is a connected component comprising of large proportion of nodes. So in the right hand side table, um, the proportion of the nodes in the largest connected component are listed for different data sets and different um, decomposition level. And when K is small, for example, when K is one, then we can observe that uh, the proportion is very high, which means that there exists a large connected component. But when K gets larger, um, hyper edges that are smaller than K does not create any subsets anymore. So the decomposed graph will be very sparse. So yeah, it becomes less connected. And another thing that we can observe using the decomposed graphs is that is the clustering coefficient. So the local clustering coefficient, I'm sorry, is defined as the, the ratio of the connected pairs of neighbors of the given node. So for example, um, for example, in the left-hand side figure, um, there are five neighbors of node U and um, three, three pairs of the neighbors are connected while there can be at most 10 pairs of connections. So the local clustering coefficient of node U will be three over 10. And the clustering coefficient of the entire graph will be the average numbers of uh, average local clustering coefficient of the nodes in the graph. And on the right hand side table, we can see the clustering coefficient of the real world hypergraphs or the decomposed graphs and that of random neural graphs. And we can see that the clustering coefficient is typically higher in real world hypergraphs compared to random neural graphs. So, and since clustering coefficient measures the likelihood of having links between friends of friends, we can conclude that real world hypergraphs are more clustered than neural graphs. And the last observation is the effective diameter of the decomposed graphs. So the effective diameter is defined as the minimum distance such, such that approximately 90% of all connected pairs are reachable. So on the right hand side table, is the list of effective diameters of um, different data sets and we compare with random neural models. And for example, if we see the co-authorship DBRP hypergraph on the top, it has like 2 million nodes, but their effective diameter is only 6.8, which is very um, small compared to their numbers of nodes. But this property is not a property that is distinguished by the random models because some of the neural models also have more effective diameters. Okay, so these, these were the, some of the basic static patterns and let's move on to advanced static patterns. So in this subpart, we will cover patterns discovered by four papers. And uh, the first advanced pattern is triangles in hypergraphs. And this was introduced in the journal in 2018. So before moving on, let's review a simple background. So a triangle is defined as a three nodes that are connected to each other. And the number of triangles or the counts of triangles in the graph is an important primitive 
and it is it is very useful in various applications like community detection, spam detection, or link predictions in graphs. And the question is, how can we define triangles in hypergraphs? So in hypergraph, we have to consider not only the pairwise relations between the nodes, but also the triwise relations um, to define hypergraphs. And based on this idea, there can be two types of triangles in a hypergraph, um, as we can see in the figure. One in the left-hand side is an open triangle, and uh, one in the right-hand side is the closed triangle. So in an open triangle, every pair of nodes have interacted together in some hyperatch, but all three nodes have never interacted together in a single hyperatch. And in case of closed triangle, all three nodes have appeared in a single hyperatch together. So from the definition, we can know that closed triangles cannot be captured in pairwise graphs because it requires at least triwise relations of three nodes. So it is a new concept of triangles in a hypergraph. And this definition of open and closed triangles gives um, some interesting observations. And first thing, um, first observation we're going to see is the ratio of open and closed triangles um, and how it correlates with other metrics. So in the figure, the x-axis is the edge density of the projected graph of the hypergraph. And in the y-axis is ratio of the open triangles. And each um, dot in the figure is different data set and the marker of the dot. So whether it is circle, triangle, or square, these markers represent the domains of each data set. And we can observe that data sets from the same domain are plotted closely in the figure. And this means that the fraction of open triangles is a meaningful measurement of hypergraph structure. And in this figure, each dot represents the ego network of a node. So ego network of a node is a set of hyper edges that contains the node. And in this figure, the x-axis the, is the average degree of the ego, node, ego network. And the y-axis is the same as the previous one. It is the ratio of open triangle. And from this figure, we can observe that ego networks that are from the hypergraphs in the same domain are closely plotted while those from different domains are clearly distinguished. So this means that the fraction of open triangles is useful in distinguishing ego networks based on their domains. Okay, then let's move on to our next pattern, which is about higher order network motifs. So network motifs are fundamental building blocks of complex networks. And it is de um, typically defined as a subgraph pattern of three, four or five nodes. So in this figure, we can see that there are certain different types of three um, node network motifs if the directions of the edges are considered. And they typically appear in real hypergraphs at a frequency that is significantly higher than random hypergraphs and the random graphs. Then how can you define motifs in hypergraphs? And higher order network motifs is a generalization of network motifs and they um, additionally consider the group interactions between the nodes. So for example, for three nodes, there can be six different net higher order network motifs as we can see in this figure. And I note that if, we, if the only the pairwise relationships between the nodes are considered, then only two types on the left-hand side can be described. But if we additionally consider group interactions or at least triwise relations between the three nodes, then we can um, further describe the patterns into six different types of higher order network motifs. Then what kind of analysis can we do using higher order network motifs? Um, given a hypergraph, we can count the number of the times that each higher order network motifs appeared. And then we can co compare the counts that appeared in random hypergraphs. So in this figure, the X axis is each of the six different types of higher order network motifs. And the Y axis is the abundance of higher order motifs compared to random hypergraphs. So basically, if the, y, the, the abundance is positive, then that means that the uh, corresponding a higher order network motifs appeared more times in real world hypergraphs compared to random hypergraphs. And if it is negative, then it means that, yeah, um, it appeared more times in random hypergraphs. And from this 
um, and we compare the, the, the authors compared the hypergraphs from four different domains, um, social technology, co-authorship, and biology, which are distinguished by different colors. And we can observe that um, different high order network motifs are highlighted in each domain. So for example, if we see the fourth higher order network motifs, these motifs um, appear more times in like co-authorship or biology hypergraphs uh, compared to random hypergraphs. But in case of like social or technology hypergraphs, uh, it appears more or less than in random hypergraphs. So from this kind of an investigation, we can analyze which motif, it, which higher order network motifs, or what kind of local structure is important for constructing each hypergraph. So let's take a look at more precise results. So for each data set, we first um, count the instance the number of instances of um, higher order network motifs that appeared in each hypergraph, then we can um, construct a six dimensional vector, right? So each element will be the number of counts that the higher order or the motifs appeared in the hypergraph. And then we can compute the correlation coefficient, like Pearson correlation coefficient between the six dimensional vectors of the two different hypergraphs. Then um, the correlation will imply how much similar the local structures are of the two hypergraphs. And this heat map represents the correlations um, it ranges between minus one and one for every pairs of data sets. And each data set belongs to one of the four domains on the left-hand side legend. Um, and it is colored in the left side of the hit, uh, heat map. And we can observe that um, the correlation is very high between hypergraphs that are from the same domain, but um, those from different domains have very low correlation. And this means that high order network motifs effectively characterize the local structure of the hypergraph. Okay, then the next pattern will be about hypergraph motifs. And yeah, so we previously saw the high order network motifs, and this one is also about motifs in hypergraphs, but it is de um, defined in a different way. And this pattern was introduced in RareDB 2020. So recall that the previous higher order network motifs is defined by the um, subgraph pattern of like a fixed number of nodes. So typically we defined the higher order network motifs as a pattern of three um, connected nodes. But in case of high hypergraph motifs or H motifs, um, it describes the connectivity patterns of three connected hyper edges, not the nodes. So um, as you can see in this Venn diagram, the three hyper edges can construct seven different subsets and H motifs describe the connectivity pattern uh, based on the emptiness of the seven subsets. So this emptiness means that whether there exist any numbers of nodes in the subset or not. So since there are seven different subsets, there can exist up to 128 different cases, but only 26 H motifs remain. Once we exclude symmetric ones, those cannot be obtained from distinct hyper edges, or those cannot be obtained from connected hyper edges. And as shown in the figure, um, there can exist from H motif one to H motif 26, and the colored subset is uh, mean that the subset is non-empty, so there exist any numbers of nodes, and the non-colored subset um, means that the subset is empty. So let's see an example. So on the left hand side, we're given with a hypergraph with four hyper edges with eight nodes, and um, on the, um, from this hypergraph, we can find some several numbers of instance of H motifs. So for example, hyper edge E1, E2, and E3 in the hypergraph is connected. So this will uh, be one of the instance of the hypergraph motifs. And we can um, see the emptiness of the seven subsets on the below, and this corresponds to the H motif six. And there are three important properties of hypergraph motifs. And first one is that it is exhaustive. So H motifs capture connectivity patterns of all possible three connected hyper edges. This means that any three connected hyper edges in the hypergraph is an instance of one of the 26 different types of H motifs. And the second property is that it is unique. So this means the connectivity pattern of 
the three connected hyperedges is captured by at most one H motif. And the last um, property is that it is size independent. So H motifs capture connectivity patterns independently of the sizes of hyperedges. So this is the last property is quite important because um, the size flexibility of the hyperedges in the hypergraph is one of the very important properties of the hypergraph. Then why are non-pairwise relations of the hyperedges considered? And the answer to this question is that um, non-pairwise relations play a key role in capturing the local structure patterns of real-world hypergraphs. So in the figure, we are given two instances of um, hypergraph motifs, one on the left-hand side with hyperedges E2, E3, and E4. And on the right-hand side, we are given an instance of hyperedges E1, E3, and E4. And these two instances have exactly the same pairwise relations. So which means that, for example, in the left one, um, E2 and E4 are not connected. They don't share any nodes, but the hyperedge E3 bridges them. And the same thing happens on the right-hand side instance. So E1 and E4 are not connected, but E3 is bridging them. So these two instances have the same pairwise relations, but these two patterns are distinguished by different H motifs, as we can see in these two Venn diagrams, right? And this is um, important in characterizing local structural patterns of hypergraphs, as we will discuss later. And the another question is that how can we summarize H motif properties of the hypergraph? So in order to compare the local structures of different sized hypergraphs, so the, we want to compare the local structures of hypergraphs with different numbers of nodes and different numbers of hyperedges, then we need a representative vector that is independent to the size of the hypergraph. So um, we compute a a uh, 26 dimensional compact vector that where each element is the normalized significance of every H motif. So the significance of a specific H motif T is defined as uh, in this equation. So we basically compare the counts of the H motif in the given real world hypergraph and that of random hypergraphs and compute this equation to measure the significance of the H motif. So as you can see in this equation, um, the significance will be positive if the number of instances that were observed in real world hypergraphs are larger than in random hypergraphs and vice versa. And um, this significance of the hypergraph motifs are normalized and uh, we construct a 26 dimensional characteristic profiles as in this equation. So um, CP or characteristic profiles is a compact vector, vector that summarizes the H motif information of the given hypergraph. And since we normalize the significance, the values in CPs are independent to the size of the hypergraph. Okay, so now let's see some um, what uh, we can analyze using H motifs. So first, uh, we compare the number of instances that were counted in real-world hypergraphs and random hypergraphs. So here uh, in the two distributions, the x-axis are the hypergraph motif index. So it will be from one to 26. And the y-axis is the log scaled, uh, the number of instances that were observed in the hypergraph. And we compare the distributions of real-world hypergraph and random hypergraphs that are colored in um, green and red respectively. And from these figures, we can observe that um, the distributions are very different between real world and random hypergraphs, which uh, implies that the local structures of real world hypergraphs are um, clearly distinguished or yeah, distinguished from random hypergraphs. And next we plot CPs of each data set. So um, record that CP is a 26 dimensional vector of each hypergraph. And here the x-axis is the hypergraph index, a motif index, one from, from one to 26. And the y-axis is the CP of each H motif. So it is basically the normalized significance of the corresponding H motif. And um, interestingly, CPs are very similar between hypergraphs from the same domain, but very different from those from different domains. So for example, if we see the left-hand side figures, uh, let's see the first, um, the upper one first. So in this figure, we compare the CPs of three different hypergraphs. 
from the same domain, which is co-authorship. And we can observe that the distributions are close to identical. And one more important thing is that these three hypergraphs have different sizes. So they, they all have different numbers of nodes and hyper edges, but CPs effectively um, yeah, capture the, uh, can compare the, uh, the hypergraphs with different sizes. And in case of tax domain, we compare two data sets from this domain and we can see very similar results. And we can also see that the distributions are very different between the domains. So you can see that distributions here and here on the left one is very different. And this means that um, CPs based on H motifs um, play a key role in capturing the local structural patterns of real world hypergraphs. And then we can compute the correlation between the CPs between the two hypergraphs. So these are the, um, the left hand side one is the heat map of the um, correlations that are computed based on CPs um, based on hypergraph motifs. And the right heat map is uh, the CPs based on CPs computed based on network motifs, which only consider pairwise relations. And we can see that CPs based on H motif, which is on the left hand side, um, capture local structure patterns more accurately than CPs based on network motifs. Okay, so the last um, pattern will be about ego networks in hypergraph. So an ego network of a node is the set of hyper edges that contains the node. So it's a sub hypergraph um, that con uh, which is a set of hyper edges that contains the ego node. And one of the measures for sub hypergraphs uh, or ego nodes are density. So density measures how densely hyper edges are overlapped. And it is defined by the number of hyper edges in the sub hypergraph divided by the number of nodes. So in the, the example on the left-hand side hypergraph, there are seven nodes and um, four hyper edges are overlapped. So the density of this hypergraph or ego network will be four over seven. And using density, we can measure how hyper edges in real-world hypergraphs are overlapped compared to random hypergraphs. So in these figures, um, we have distributions of three different hypergraphs and the x-axis is the, the number of nodes in the ego network. And the y-axis is the number of hyper edges of the ego network. So each dot will be an ego network of the hypergraph. And we compare the distributions of real world and random hypergraphs, which are colored in green and red respectively. And by definition, the density was the, the number of hyper edges divided by number of nodes. So, so the slope of the distribution will be um, indicate the average density of the ego networks of the hypergraph. And we can see that the slope is steeper in real world hypergraphs compared to random hypergraphs. So um, we can um, say that um, ego networks and real world hypergraphs have higher density compared to random hypergraphs. But um, one question that we faced was that does density fully capture the degree of overlaps of a set of hyper edges? So if we can see in these two hypergraphs, for example, our intuition is that the hypergraph on the left-hand side is more overlapped than compared to the right-hand side, right? But they are, both of them have the same number of nodes and same number of hyper edges, so their density are the same, which does not meet our intuition. So our question was that what is the principled measure for evaluating the degree of overlaps of a set of hyper edges? And to answer to this question, we present three axioms that any reasonable measures of the hyper edges um, overlaps should satisfy. And then based on these axioms, we propose a new matrix uh, for measuring the, the overlapness, um, the degree of overlaps of the hyper edges, which we call overlapness. So the first axiom is the number of hyper edges. So if we were given two hypergraphs with the same sizes of hyper edges and same number of nodes, then the one with the more hyper edges overlap more. And this is quite intuitive because um, yeah, more hyper edges than more overlaps. Yeah, so that's quite intuitive. And the second axiom is that if we are given uh, two, two hypergraphs with same numbers of nodes, which have the same sizes, then the one with less number of nodes are more overlapped. So this means that, uh, as we can see in this figure, 
the one with less number of nodes uh, should be measured to have more um, high degree of overlapness because the, the same um, conditions of hyperadds is more concentrate on the small subsets of nodes. And the last axiom is the sizes of hyperadds. So if the number of nodes and the number of hyperadds are the same, then the one with the larger hyperadds are more overlapped. And this is because um, if we have larger hyperadds, then more nodes will be will share interactions um, at the same time. So yeah, so larger hyperadds can induce more overlaps to the hypergraph. So based on these axioms, um, we define overlapness for measuring the dense, the degree of um, overlapness of the hyperadges, and it is defined by the sum of the hyperadges divided by the number of nodes. So um, record that the density we only consider the number of nodes here in the equation, but we additionally consider the sizes of the hyperadges. And for in this case, for example, the sizes of hyperadges is twelve. The sum of the sizes is twelve, and the number of nodes that the hyperadges overlap is seven. So the overlapness will be computed as twelve over seven. Okay, so let's go back to our previous example. So we are given two hypergraphs, and our intuition was that the one in the left hand side um, hyperadges are more overlap but they, both of them have the same number of nodes and same number of hyperadges, so the density was the same. But if we compute the overlapness of the two hypergraphs, then we can see that um, the overlapness of the left-hand side hypergraph is larger than the left-hand side one, which meets our intuition, finally. And this is because overlapness uh, um, satisfies all the axioms while the other um, intuitive metrics um, including the density does not. And we can observe um, in the same way as we did for density. In this case, the x-axis is the number of nodes of the ego network and the y-axis is the, num the sum of the sizes of the ego network. And by definition, the slope will indicate the average overlapness of the ego network. And we can see that um, ego networks in real world hypergraphs tend to have higher overlapness than those in random hypergraphs. So this was the part two about the static structure pattern of real world hypergraphs. Uh, and these are the references to the papers. So if you're interested, um, yeah, please take a look at this. So yeah, this is end of the part two. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to ask. Uh um, um, thank you for your talk and I have a question that mm -hmm. um, is it possible to add some hyper edges to hypergraph? Um, for example, you you said uh, co-authors hypergraph mm -hmm. um, their their hyper nodes are student and hyper mm -hmm. edge is paper, right? Yeah. And can we add um, university? Hyper edge to the graph. I think um, in this tutorial, um, our basic hypothesis is that um, we don't consider the types of the hyper edges. So, um, for example, yeah, so all hyper edges is a single type, it's very homogeneous. But in case of your case, I think um, what you're meaning is that the types of hyper edges can be like, classified, like publication or a university or like project team. And in that case, we can, yeah, of course, extend to like heterogeneous hypergraphs with different edge types. Uh, so I think that's a possible extension of the, our, yeah, our um, research idea. Um, the, as you know, are there any research about multiple hyper edges like that? Yeah, um, actually in, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, the public hypergraph data sets released by Austin Benson, there are hypergraphs that have different edge types and different node types. So I think you can check those um, data sets if you're oh, interested. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a good question. Are there any more questions? Uh, 
Okay. Otherwise, I think we can move on to part three. And Jamin is in online, and he will share his slides. Jamin, can you share your slide? Yeah, hello. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll start with part three of this tutorial, which is dynamic structural patterns. OK, so in this part, we study the basic question. Given a dynamic hypergraph, how can we analyze its structure? Dynamic structural patterns appear in temporal hypergraphs where hyper edges are added to a hypergraph with explicit timestamps as introduced in the in introduction of this tutorial. The figure in the left shows an example hypergraph consisting of four hyper edges, which are E1, E2, E3, and E4. And each hyper edge in this graph has its own timestamp along with a set of nodes. And given such temporal hypergraphs, we study two types of patterns in this part, which are basic structural patterns and more advanced patterns defined on the sub hypergraph level. Let me start with the basic patterns. So, so the structure of this part is the same as in the previous part, studying static hypergraphs. In this part, we study the we first study the basic patterns of node, hyperedge, and hypergraph levels, and then we move on to the advanced pattern defined in the sub-hypergraph level. And first, we'll I'll introduce basic patterns presented in four previous works. As a background, I'll briefly introduce the idea of temporal hypergraphs, although Gunn introduced the concept in the introduction briefly. Temporal hypergraphs consist of temporal hyper edges. Unlike in static hypergraphs, hyper edges consisting of the same set of nodes can appear multiple times at different time steps. This figure shows an evolving process of a hypergraph starting from a single hyper edge at timestamp one, consisting of three nodes one, four, and five. In the process, uh, you can see that the uh, set of nodes 6, 7, and 8 at, at timestamp 4 is added again at timestamp T5. So the typer edges added at timestamp T4 and T5 have the identical set of nodes. Likewise, the set of nodes 4, 5, and 6 added at timestamp T3 is added again at timestamp T5. And this is very normal in temporal hypergraphs, and we treat them differently, although they have the same set of nodes, because their different timestamps distinguish their properties in the temporal hypergraph. And each, each temporal hyper edge consists of a set of nodes and the timestamp it arrived at. This example hypergraph consists of four hyper edges, which arrived at different timestamps, seven, 10, 11, and 12. So they have different sets of nodes, but as I said, it is possible that different hyper edges have the same set of nodes. First, I'll introduce three basic dynamic patterns presented in a KDD 2018 paper, which are repeat behavior, subject correlation, and recency bias. Repeat behavior as the first pattern means that temporal hyper edges tend to repeat previous ones. In these two figures, we count the fraction of exactly repeated hyper edges and entirely novel hyper edges in eight different real world hypergraphs. The left figure shows that many hyper edges are exact repeats of a previous hyper edge, shown by the high y value. So the fraction denoted in the y-axis is close to one in some cases, even though it decreases with the size of hyper edges. And the right-hand side figure shows that hyper edges consisting of completely new nodes are not common and they are very rare, even when the size of hyper edges is, is small or even one. These two figures show that most hyper edges in real world hypergraphs contain at least one existing node 
and they are even the exact repeats of existing hyper edges in the temporal hypergraph. And as the next pattern, subset correlation means that subsets of nodes in a temporal hypergraph tend to be correlated. This table compares the number of appearances of size two and size three subsets of nodes in real hypergraphs compared to the, those in the randomized ones. Here, the random hypergraphs mean their hyper edges are replaced with random node sets preserving their sizes, and they work as a null model of this analysis. This table shows that all real hypergraphs, like their A hypergraphs, have more appearances of the same subset, subsets of nodes than in the null models, representing the high correlation in real world data. This represents that even though nodes are not contained in an ex exact hyper edge, subsets of nodes can appear multiple times and provide a meaningful characteristic and high correlation between them in a temporal hypergraph. And the next part, and the last pattern in the, this first paper is the recency bias, which means that temporal hyper edges tend to be similar to recent ones than older ones. We have already observed in the repeat behavior pattern that the, the hyper edges with the same set of nodes are added repeatedly to a hypergraph. This figure shows, shows that the similarity between different hyper edges, which is measured by the Jacquard index, is the highest with the recent hyper edges and then decreases in older hyper edges existing in a hypergraph. This means that the repeat behavior of temporal hyper edges also have, has temporal locality depending on the time it has arrived at the, uh, the temporal hypergraph. Next, we introduce three more basic patterns in the hypergraph level presented by an ICDM 2020 paper. The patterns include diminishing overlaps, densification, and shrinking diameter. Diminishing overlaps means that the overlap between hyper edges decreases eventually, uh, decreases over time. These three figures show the number of intersecting pairs between multiple hyper edges when a hypergraph grows. So the x axis in these figures represents the number of all pairs in a hypergraph. And we can consider it as time because the number of pairs always increases over time, or specifically always the same or increases over time. So we can observe that over time, how the number of intersecting pairs changes by drawing a regression line, which is y equals x to the exponent. And we observe from the three data sets that the exponent in the regression function between x and y is lower than one in all cases, meaning that the relative overlapness decreases over time because the exponent p is lower than one. On the other hand, we can observe a different observation from another property of a hypergraph. So here, densification means that average node degree of a hypergraph increases over time. So in this slide, we do the same analysis as in the previous slide, except that we change the meanings of the x and the y axis. So the x axis is the number of nodes, and the y axis is the number of hyper edges in a hypergraph. And also in this case, the x axis can be considered as time because the number of nodes increases over time as a hypergraph grows. And if we see the exponent values of the three regression functions from three, three different data sets, the exponent is higher than one in all cases, representing that the density of a hypergraph, which is the same as the average node degree by definition, decreases over time. And as the last pattern of this paper, Shrinking diameter means that the effective diameter of hypergraphs eventually decreases over time. And the concept of effective diameter was introduced in the static graph part 
but I'll introduce it quickly again. So the effective diameter is defined as the smallest distance that most nodes in a hypergraph are connected. So it can be intuitively understood as the radius of a hypergraph, which is expected to increase over time as a hypergraph grows. This is very natural because we can expect that uh, the smallest distance will increase if the hypergraph size increases. However, these figures show that the effective diameter eventually decreases over time after a third, certain threshold of the number of nodes in three different data sets. This is because the densification pattern, which we have observed earlier, uh, connects distant nodes in a hypergraph with increased density. So at the first part, as the hypergraph grows, those become more distant over time. But after a certain threshold, because of the densification, there will be there are hyper edges that connect distant and separated nodes over time. So that dens densification makes nodes connected more closely in a large hypergraph, uh, making the defective diameter eventually decrease over time. Next, I'll introduce two more basic patterns presented in an ICDM 2021 paper, which are hyper edge repetition and temporal locality. First, hyper edge repetition means that temporal hyper edges in real world hypergraphs are repetitive and the number of repetitions is heavy tailed. These figures show the distribution of the number of hyper edges with respect to the number of repetitions in the log log scale. So in the log log scale, they show a linear pattern between X and Y, and that represents the heavy tail distribution or the power law distribution of their property. And this means that few hyper edges are repeated extensively while most hyper edges are repeated only a few times, like one or a few times. So this is the case of the famous phenomenon, the rich gets richer in terms of the repetition of hyper edges, which is natural because as in the static hypergraphs, if some nodes form a very strong correlation between each other and make a hyper edge that appears multiple times in a hypergraph, it is likely that it appears again in the hypergraph because of that high correlation between the nodes included in the hyper edge. And then temporal locality means that future temporal hyper edges are more likely to repeat re recent ones. So this is similar to the previous observation in this part which, whose name is repeat behavior. So this, Figures, these three figures compare real world hypergraphs and random hypergraphs with different colors and different symbols like triangles and circles. And here the random hypergraph works as a null model, which we can compare with the real world hypergraphs with. Here the x axis is the number of consecutive identical hyper edges, and the y axis means the time interval for them to appear all. So specifically, the time interval is defined as the difference of timestamps between the first and the last hyper edges. So if the time interval is small, it means that the, the same consecutive temporal hyper edges appear in a very short time range. And these all three figures from three different data sets show a consistent pattern where the real world hypergraphs have have smaller time intervals for all values of n than in the random hypergraphs. This means that real world hypergraphs have much stronger locality, in, stronger temporal locality of identical hyper edges compared with the null model. Next, we introduce four basic patterns in the hyper edge level presented by a paper in the journal Scientific Report 2021. These patterns include hyper edge sizes and frequencies, temporal heterogeneity, burst behavior, and temporal reinforcement. The first pattern is about hyper edge sizes and frequencies. Specifically, smaller hypergraphs, smaller hyper edges are more numerous in a real world data set. 
These figures show the number of hyper edges with respect to their sizes in five different real world data sets. In all cases, smaller hyper edges are more frequent than larger ones. This is very natural because in many cases, small relations or small correlations between nodes are more frequent than a large high order relationship contain, containing a lot of nodes. The next pattern is temporal heterogeneity of hyperedges, which represents that the emergence of hyperedges is strongly heterogeneous in time. These four figures show the emergence of hyperedges with different hyperedge sizes from two to five as different figures. And we can easily find that most hyperedges appear in a very short time ranges. Like there are five notable time ranges in of all four figures, instead of appearing uniformly at random over time. And so such bursty patterns of hyper edges are not independent of their size, since the same time ranges are shared among different hyper edge sizes in the figures. And we can see that the size five hyper edges have only one such bursty time range. And that is because the number of such large hyper edges is very small compared with other smaller hyper edges in this hyper temporal hypergraph. Next, bursty behavior of hyper edges means that hyper edges in real world hypergraphs are likely to repeatedly appear within a short time, which we just observed in the previous slide, and the distribution of their numbers of appearances is heavy tailed. In other words, Hyper edges are likely to appear in short time ranges that already contain many hyper edges as a gain can be summarized as the rich gets richer. And this heavy tail distribution is consistent in all four data sets compared with the null model represented as the empty like white circles in the speakers. And the four different colors in the figure, like the light blue to the dark blue, so we chose choose a different value of delta t, which defines a short time. But this heavy tail distribution is the same for all values of different delta t, which means that this pattern is very consistent and strong in temporal hypergraphs. We also find that larger hyperedges with sizes three or four follow the same pattern of heavy tailed distribution. And temporal reinforcement of hyperedges means that the longer the length of an interaction, the higher chance the interaction will not break down. In this figure, the x axis means the Number of, uh, number of appearances of an interaction, which is a hyper edge in our analysis. And the y-axis means the probability for each hyper edge to appear within a short time range in the future. So the gray points in the figures are just the exact opposites of the blue points. So we can just focus on the blue dots in the spheres. So if we see the blue dots, the probability increases consistently with the number of number of appearances and which is one in many cases like in the first three data sets workplace hospital and conference this means that a hyper edge is is likely to appear in the near future if it has appeared multiple times before which totally makes sense because the high number of appearances means that the, the nodes in the hyper edge are more closely co correlated and they will, it is likely that they will appear again in the near future. Such temporal reinforcement exists in also in larger hyper edges as well, whose sizes are either three or four. And these figures are the, drawn in the same way as in the figures in the previous slide. Next, we move on to advanced patterns, which are defined on the subhypergraph level. And advanced patterns, we are defined on sub 
hypergraph level, and we expect they provide deeper understanding on temporal hypergraphs, although they can be a little bit more complex than the basic patterns. We introduced four papers that discover such advanced patterns. At first, we introduced the pattern of simplical closure, which was presented in a PNAS 2018 paper. As a background, a triadic closure in a network is a tendency of forming a triangle for three disconnected, disconnected or connected nodes, which are not forming a triangle. In the left graph, nodes B and C are not directly connected, but they share a common neighbor, which is node A. Then, in many cases, it is likely that nodes B and C make a direct connection in the future, making a triangle of nodes A, B, and C. So this phenomenon is commonly observed in many real-world graphs, for example, in social networks, because people get become friends if they share a lot of common friends in a Facebook, Twitter, or any other services, or even other types of networks like citation networks or co-authorship networks. And because we focus on a hypergraph in this tutorial, every hypergraph can be transformed into a weighted projected graph by decomposing high order relationship into pairwise ones. So this is the same as in the click expansion, which is a intuitive way to convert a hypergraph into a graph. But the difference is that the resulting graph here has a weight for each pairwise node in the original graph. In this example, you can see by the red arrow that nodes one and two have a weight of two in, in their connection in the projected graph because they are included in two different hyper edges in the original hypergraph. One is with nodes one, two, and six in the left side of the hypergraph, and the other is a four node hyper edge containing nodes one, two, three, and four. That dashed line in the hyper edge means that the line is the, uh, behind the, the, the edge between nodes one and four. And in the generated weighted projected graph, we call an edge a weak tie if its weight is one, and we call it a strong tie if its weight is larger than one. And we do not differentiate uh, like stronger ties whose weight is like larger than two, because like the, the differentiation between weak ties with weight one and strong ties with weight larger than one is enough for our analysis. And in hypergraphs, there are two types of triangles as introduced in the part two of this tutorial on static hypergraphs. An open triangle means that every pair of nodes in a triangle is included in any hyper edge in a hypergraph, but there is no single hyper edge that contains all of them. On the other hand, a closed triangle means that all three nodes are included in a single hyper edge. And we can consider that a closed triangle implies a stronger relationship between the included nodes I, J, K in this example than an open triangle because they form a high order relationship which does, does not exist in an open triangle. So we mainly focus, we are mainly interested in how the nodes form closed triangles from disconnected nodes or from open triangles. And the simplical closure means an event of forming a closed triangle from three nodes that did not form a closed triangle. This example illustrates a process of making a closed triangle from three disconnected nodes one, two, and six in the left leftmost sphere. We find that uh, nodes one and two make a connection at timestamp one when a hyper edge containing nodes one, two, three, and four is added. We do not represent nodes three and four in this figure, but that hyper edge creates a connection between nodes one and two in, in this figure. And the other two connections between uh, nodes one and six and between nodes two and six are generated in the same way in timestamps T2 and T3 based on the added hyper edges. Then 
we call on the band uh, simply called closure if the open triangle transforms into the closed triangle with a new hyper edge containing nodes one, two, and six at times time four, T4. Based on the concept of simplical closure, we can draw a trajectory of simplical closure in a real world hypergraph. This is an example of a co authorship hypergraph that goes from the leftmost three disconnected nodes to the rightmost, a closed triangle. At each arrow, there are two numbers. The top number counts triples of nodes that never experience a simplical closure event and the bottom number counts triples that go through a simple cold closure. So if we see the, the topmost arrow from the three disconnected nodes directly to the closed triangle, the top number is zero because all of the instances uh, corresponding to this arrow make a tr closed triangle. So the bottom number is large, but the top number is zero. So we can make two main observations from this example trajectory. First, most closed triangles are formed with no previous interaction as shown in the red circle. So the value there, which is to over 2 million, is much larger than all values in all other areas. This makes sense because if a hyperedge whose size is larger than 2, which whose size can be even like 10 or 20, it of such hyper edges make new closed triangles between disconnected nodes. On the other hand, the second observation is about the two numbers uh, pointed by the blue circles. So the starting point of the blue circles is an open triangle with weak ties. So the three nodes are connected with the uh, edges of weight one. And if we compare the two blue numbers, we can see that open triangles of weak ties are more likely to form a strong tie before closing than going directly to the closed triangle because the number 400 is larger than the 328 in the blue numbers where the 435 represents the number of triangles that make it one of its ties stronger than before. Then there are two questions that we can study for the simplical closure. How does the simplical closure occur? And can you predict it from the structure of the project graph? The approach of this paper, like PNAS 2018 paper, is to count open triples of nodes in the first 80% of data in time, and then to compute the ratio of them transforming into closed triangles. So we can study when this ratio becomes high or low based on the structural properties of the given hypergraph on the first 80% of data. One observation is that increased edge density increases simplical closure probability. So in this, in this figure, we compare the probabilities of simplical closure from two types of triple subnodes. In, so in this figure, the x-axis corresponds to an open triangle with three edges with weak ties, and the y-axis corresponds to a chain of three nodes without forming a triangle. So we can expect that uh, the, the triangle in the x-axis is more stronger than the chain in the y-axis, and the, the open triangle will be more likely to form a closed triangle because their connections are are more strong or specifically their connections are more than the, the chain in the chain. And as expectation in the figure, we find that all data sets uh, in, in the figure, each dot is a different data set and all data sets are below the diagonal line, which means that the probability of simple closure is higher if nodes form triangles. Another observation is that increased tie strength increases simplical closure probability. We draw a figure in the same way as in the previous slide, and at the same time, each dot represents a different data set. And but the difference is we change the meanings of the x and y axes. 
So the y-axis is an open triangle with only weak ties, and the x-axis is an open triangle containing a strong tie. So in the figure, most data sets, like most all of data sets are below the diagonal line, except for two or three exceptions that are slightly above the diagonal line, which means that triangles with stronger ties have higher simple cold closure probability, which is perfectly makes sense and which is corresponds to our expectation. The last observation on simple cold closure is that the relative importance of edge density and high strength depends on the data set. So in the previous two slides, we have observed that both of higher edge density, which is denoted in the y-axis of this figure, and the higher tie strength shown in the x-axis of this figure increase simply cold closure probabilities. So we know that these two patterns are both important for for getting or approximating the simple cold closure probability. But the question here is which one is more important? So if we put them in the X and the Y axis dip of this figure respectively, then the data sets do not show a consistent pattern with regard to the diagonal line. This means that their relative importance depends on the data set. But still we can have some uh, some consistent observations depending on the domains or some domains. For example, in the figure, the thread hypergraphs are represented as circles. So here the shape of each dot is uh, the domain of each data set. But we can find that three thread hypergraphs represented as circles are all below the diagonal line. And we can say that this domain is somewhat has more importance in the higher tie strength than in the higher edge density. But the main observation here is that such relative importance is, is depending on the data set. So it is hard to make a consistent observation that works in all types of hypergraphs that we are studying in this work. So this is, that was the end of the first advanced pattern. And I think we can stop here and take a break, take a 30 minute break and then continue at 4 p.m. about the remaining advanced patterns. And before we take a break, I can... I, I mean, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, I think we are ready to start again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so I'll continue the part three of this tutorial, which is about the, the patterns in dynamic or temporal hypergraphs. So we covered uh, all basic patterns defined on the node hyper edge and hypergraph levels. And we were I was introducing the advanced patterns on the sub hypergraph level. So I already introduced one advanced pattern, which is about simply cold closure, and I'll discuss three more advanced patterns introduced in three different previous works. So the first pattern is about the persistence of higher order interactions or HOI, which was studied in an SDM 2022 paper. So, a higher order interaction or an HOI is the co-appearance of a set of nodes in any hyper edge. And such HOIs can appear repeatedly over time. In this example, we consider five hyper edges appear at different timestamps from 2018 to 2022. In this example, we are interested in an HOI consisting of three nodes, Amy, Bob, and Carl. This, and this HOI consisting of three nodes appears three times in the five hyper edges in 2018, 2021, and 2022. This means that there is a strong connection between these three nodes, even though the exact hyper edge that consists of exactly these three nodes appears only once in 2021. So focusing on only the complete hyper edges can make us miss such highly correlated to triples or pairs or subsets of nodes 
that we call on HOI in this study. The persistence of an HOI S over time range T is the number of time units in T when S co-appears in any hyperedge. In this example, we consider an HOI containing the three pink nodes in T1. In this example, its persistence is three since uh, a hyperedge containing this HOI appears three times in timestamp T2, T3, and T4. The hyperedge in T4 does not include this HOI, so it's not included in computing the persistence of this HOI. In these three figures, we find that the frequency of HOI persistence is heavy tailed across different sizes of HOIs. So in, in these three figures, we, we draw a distribution of the frequency of an HOI with respect to its persistence value. And the heavy tail distribution means that an HOI that appears in many hyper edges is likely to appear again in the future following the rich gets richer phenomenon. So a few, only a few HOIs appear very much in a hypergraph and most HOIs appear like one or two times by following this heavy tail distribution. One question we can study on HOI persistence is that what structural features are related to HOI persistence? To answer to the question, we examine relations between various structural features and HOI persistence in the following setting. So first, we start from the first appearance of a hyperedge containing an HOI which we are interested in. And we observe the structural features in the first TS time units, denoted as the blue arrow. And based on the structural features on these TS time units, we measure the persistence in the next TP time units to see which structural features are related to HOI persistence. For that, we define basic structural features of each AOIS as follows. These structural features include the number of hyper edges, including S, the sum of sizes or of hyper edges containing S, etc. So then we, we group or combine the structural features into the following eight terms, which are more interpretable than the row features. And we want to study the correlations or the relationship between these structural features and HOI persistence to answer to the question. And in this slide, we measure the normalized mutual information and the Pearson correlation coefficient between the structural features and HOI persistence. In this table, each column means uh, each structural feature that we study in this analysis, and the rows represent the, the values of the mutual information and Pearson correlation coefficient based on the size of HIs. So for each value, the higher, the better, the higher, the better correlated between the structural features with the HOI persistence. And there are two main observations from this table. So the first, if you see the red column, the number of hyper edges containing the HOI colored as, as red is positively correlated with HOI persistence. And another thing, another column colored as green. If you see the if we see the column, the entropy of the sizes of hyper edges containing the HOI colored as green is also positively related, correlated with the HOI persistence. The red column, the number of hyper edges is uh it makes sense, and this is consistent with other similar observations presented earlier of this tutorial, because if an HOI appears in more hyper edges in a hypergraph, it is more likely that it appears again in the like less n percent of the data, data set. But the uh, letter, the, the green part is interesting because it means that hyper edges with similar sizes 
increases HOI persistence in the future compared to hyperedges with various sizes. Because if the hyperedges containing this HOI have various sizes, it results in increasing the entropy of the sizes, which is the value of eight term that we are interested in as a structural feature. So this can be understood as if an HOI appears multiple times in hyperedges with similar sizes, it means that their correlations are more principled or strong so that they are more likely to appear again in the future. We move on to the next paper presented at ICDM 2021, which studies temporal hypergram motifs or TF motifs in short. The basic question for the motifs is, how can we define motifs in temporal hypergraphs? The answer is not straightforward, unlike in static hypergraphs, because in temporal hypergraphs, the, it contains hyperedges with the same set of nodes, but with different timestamps. In this example, consisting of six hyperedges, there are only four distinct sets of nodes appear because like, Two, two pairs of hyperedges share the same set of nodes. So it is hard to define a principled way to define motifs in the temporal hypergraphs consisting both structures and timestamps, which are related to the temporal property of this graph. In other words, if we rephrase our question, how can we capture temporal properties of hypergraphs as motifs? So, the, the authors of this paper introduced the idea of a short time range, delta, and only consider a set of hyperedges whose timestamp differences is no larger than delta. So in this way, we can select meaningful triples of hyperedges for computing temporal hypergraph motifs whose timestamps are similar to each other. So it is based on the idea that as hyperedges are added to the hypergraph sequentially based on their timestamps, uh, hyperedges that whose timestamps are very distant, like uh, timestamp one versus timestamp hundred, are not forming a meaningful triple for getting a structural structural pattern. But if their timestamps are similar, so if the difference is smaller than or equal to the given value delta, it means that their, their structures form a meaningful pattern we can study to, to understand the given hypergraph. The main difference from the hypergraph motifs in the static setting is, is that the order of the hyperedges needs to be considered in temporal hypergraphs. Because even though we set a very small value of delta, there is still an order between the three hyperedges included in a triple. And this order is very important to consider the temporal property of the given temporal hypergraph. In other words, we should treat the motifs differently, even though their structure patterns are the same, if they are or they are, they have a different orders of the hyperedges. So in this example hypergraph, E1 comes first and then E2 and then E3. So the order is E1, E2, and E3. And we, based on this order, we defined 96 temporal hypergraph motifs considering both structural patterns and the temporal order. So the way to define its Venn diagram is the same as in the static hypergraphs. So the colored regions means that there are at least one node in that like in the subset between the intersection between different hyperedges. And the empty region means that there is no node in that particular region of the, of the intersection or the remaining part of each hyperedge. So the number of motifs is much larger in this case than in the static setting because we consider the order of the three hyperedges in each motif. For example, we can consider a small hypergraph in, shown in the left part of this slide when the value of delta is three. If we pick hyperedges E2, E3, and E4, the corresponding motif can be properly found based on our definition of 96 hypergraph, temporal hypergraph motifs. 
But if we pick hyperedges E1, E3, and E4, however, we cannot find the motif since they do not arrive within the delta time units. Here, the difference between T1 and T4 is 5, which is larger than 3. So we do not consider this triple in computing the motif. Based on these temporal hypergraph motifs, we can make a character profile for each temporal hypergraph as done in the static hypergraph. So each character profile, which is a 96-dimensional vector, summarizes the structural and temporal property of a temporal hypergraph so that we can compare multiple hypergraphs in, uh, simply by looking at the generated vectors. And based on the temporal, hyper tem temporal hypergraph motifs, we see that temporal hypergraph motifs we see that it allows us to clearly distinguish real hypergraphs from randomized ones as shown in the five figures. So they, these five figures show the results on five data sets and, and we compare a real world hypergraph with the random hypergraph by using different colors for their lines, like red for the real ones and blue for the random ones. And in all cases, the real hypergraphs are clearly distinguished from the random hypergraphs in all cases. Although the random hypergraphs preserve the node degrees and hyper-edge sizes of the real hypergraphs. So it means that the random hypergraphs fail to mimic the motif patterns of real data sets. We also find that the hypergraphs from the same domain have similar motif patterns or similar character profiles, while those from different domains have very distinct character profiles. Each figure in this slide is uh, compares the hypergraphs from the same domain, like email, contact, text, and so on. And we can easily see that the colored lines in each figure are very similar to each other, while they are different, very much different from those from different domains. This means that the TF motifs play a key role in capturing both structural and temporal patterns existing hypergraphs. And in other words, TF motifs are a very good way to understand the property of a given hypergraph. We also compute the similarities between pairs of hypergraphs based on their domains, based on the different correlation coefficients in the character profiles as done in the static hypergraphs in part two of this tutorial. In these two figures, uh, color at each point represents the value of a correlation coefficient from red to blue. So the blue is good because it means that the uh, hypergraphs are correlated with the large correlation coefficient. And as in the previous slide, the hypergraphs from the same domain show high correlation coefficients between each other, while those from different domains show very low coefficients. And we can compare the result on dynamic or temporal hypergraphs with that on static hypergraphs, and we show it shows a very clear consistency between those two patterns, which means that uh, our temporal hypergraph motifs is a good as, as in the motifs in static hypergraphs. So this is another evidence that TF motifs will well capture the structural and temporal patterns. And I'll move on to the last four patterns of part three, which was which were presented in an ICDM 2021 paper. So they include intersection size of evil networks, spread of alternate networks, and tropic principles of echo networks and novelty rate of ego networks. And they are all defined on the sub hypergraph level because we are studying the advanced patterns. So hypergraph ego networks are local subgraphs containing an ego node. And the definition is the same as in static hypergraphs. There are three types of ego networks, which are star, radial, and contracted ego networks, which are depicted in three different figures in this slide. So if you see the leftmost figure, star ego network consists of the hyper edges containing the ego node. So 
And so that is the most basic form of, of Eagle Network. And if we go to the radial Eagle Network, it in also includes the hyper edges containing the neighbors of the Eagle node. So we can see that the red hyper edge here containing the neighbors of node U, but, they, but not the node U itself is included in the radial Eagle network in this, in this example. And if we go to the contracted Eagle network on top of the radial Eagle network, it contains sub hyper edges that contain the Eagle node or its neighbors. So the new hyper edge included in the contracted Eagle network is denoted as a blue, cir blue circle. And we take the subgraph sub hyper edge of this hyper edge of size three because this node is not included in the neighborhood of our is larger in radial eagle networks than in star eagle networks and then in contracted eagle networks. An alter network of node B in an eagle network of node U is the collection of hyper edges in the eagle network that contains B. In this example, given the eagle network of node U, we can find the alter networks of nodes V and nodes node D. W as the two following figures on the right side of the arrow. And it is also possible that alter networks do not contain the ego node, although it is not the case of this example. The first observation for ego networks is that temporally adjacent hyper edges are similar in ego networks. So, for, for that observation, we compute the intersection sizes of hyper edges in the three types of Eagle networks. So in these figures, the, the y-axis means the average intersection size of all temporally adjacent hyper edges in an Eagle network. Here, if you see the equation, you can see we, we compute the intersection size between edge, hyper edge SI and hyper edge SI plus one which are temporally adjacent. And in all three types of Eagle networks, real hypergraphs show stronger temporal locality than in the randomized ones if we compare the lines of different colors. So the real hypergraphs are drawn by the blue and orange lines, but the random ones are drawn by purple and green lines. And it is clearly shown that the real hypergraphs have more larger intersection, average intersection size. The next observation is that the spread of alter networks is temporally local. In, in these figures, so we draw these figures in the same way, but the y-axis means the average spread time of alter networks, which is defined as the difference of timestamps between the first and the last hyper edge as shown in this equation. So the spread time is shorter in real hypergraphs, which are denoted by a blue line, than in random hypergraphs, which are denoted in a brown line in all three types of ego networks. This represents that a node interacts with other nodes in a short range of time in its ego network. Another important property of Eagle networks is that radial and contracted Eagle networks may include hyper edges without the Eagle node U. And this is, this is because they can contain hyper edges that only include the neighbors of node U as shown in these two examples. These hyper edges colored in red or blue may arrive before the Eagle node enters the hypergraph. Based on the entropic property of Eagle networks, we can study a question across real-world radial and contracted Eagle networks, at what timestamp does the Eagle node arrive? So this is based on the observation that in radial and contracted Eagle networks, the hyper edges in the Eagle network can arrive before the Eagle node that we are interested in. So to answer the question, we observe the timestamp of Eagle node arrival with respect to the size of Eagle networks. So we have two main observations on the Eagle node arrival. So first, 
the eagle node tends to arrive before or around the fifth timestamp in radial eagle networks. And second, the eagle node tends to arrive at linear timestamp to the size in contracted eagle networks. These two observations are supported by this figure, which shows the average time on, until the eagle node arrival with respect to the length of eagle network or the size of an eagle network. The arrival time converges to five in the in radial eagle networks colored in blue. So it supports the first observation that eagle nodes tend to arrive before or around the fifth timestamp because it converges to the value of five. On the other hand, if we see the contracted eagle networks, uh, the average time until the eagle node arrival increases consistently in these graphs, which is on, on expression that another expression that the eagle node tends to arrive at linear timestamp to the size in contracted eagle networks. And then we move on to another property, the final property of eagle networks. This is the novelty rate. So the novelty of a hyperedge is the number of nodes in the hyperedge that have never been contained in any previous hyperedges in the temporal hypergraph. In this example, we the new hyperedge represented as a blue line arrives in the hypergraph and its novelty is two because it contains two new nodes colored in blue. We observe that this novelty slowly and gradually decreases in star and radial eagle networks based on these two figures. In these figures, we measure the average novelty of hyper edges in an eagle network with respect to the length of the eagle network and the ordinal time. And the results of different lengths are shown with different colors. Like for example, the result of eagle network of length 10 is shown as a blue line and so on. And this these two figures show that in both cases, novelty gradually decreases over time, although the pattern is not very clear. Like, so there are some up, upside arrows in the star eagle network, but the overall pattern is the gradual decrease over time. In, on the other hand, in contracted eagle network, the, the decrease pattern of the novelty is more clear, clearer than in the previous slide. So in, if we draw the same figure for on contracted eagle networks, the, the decrease of novelty is much clearer, but the speed of decrease is very slow as shown in the gradient of this line. So this represents that temporal hypergraphs grow at a near constant rate for the majority of lifetimes because the novelty is decreasing, clearly decreasing, but its speed is very slow. So we can say that the speed of growth, growth of a hypergraph is near constant based on the analysis of this figure. So this is the end of part three, dynamic structure patterns. And this is a list of references included in this part and more. Yeah. So there are seven related papers on this part. Thank you for listening. And if you have questions, I think you can answer to the questions and then we can move on to the last part of this tutorial. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I'll stop the screen sharing and Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Jamin, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm Ki Jung from KAIST and I'm in charge of the last part of this tutorial, which is about generative models. Okay, give me one second. Okay. 
Oh yeah, now it works. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so the question that we would like to answer in this part is how can we generate realistic hypergraphs? And this question is related to the next question. What are underlying mechanisms that lead to the observed patterns that we covered in the previous part of this tutorial? And why do generative models matter? And generative models can be used for various purposes. And the first purpose is to explain patterns, right? So we have nice patterns. And if the nice patterns can be reproduced by a simple mechanism, then the simple mechanism may be the reasons of the patterns, right? So by reproducing the patterns, we can find potential reasons of the patterns. And generative models can also be used for statistical testing, right? So if we find a good pattern, which seems surprising, but the patterns can also be reproduced by a very simple generative model like random hypergraphs, then maybe the patterns are not that surprising, right? And generative models can also be used for benchmark data generation. So let's assume that we have a very cool hypergraph algorithm and it is really fast, it is really scalable, but unfortunately, real world hypergraphs are too small to test the algorithm. In such a case, we can create a much larger hypergraph and which is still realistic. And then we can use the data set to test our algorithm. Right, and generative models can also be used for anonymization. So let's assume that you're working for a company. So you have a very good hypergraph data, but you cannot make the data publicly available because of privacy issues. So maybe the hypergraphs can have sensitive information, right? And in such a case, you can create a synthetic hypergraph that is very similar to the real graph, and you can make the synthetic graph public instead of the real hypergraph, for example, for research purposes. Okay, so uh, the third part is about generative models, and the generative models are largely categorized by uh, whether they create static hypergraphs or dynamic hypergraphs. And the first sub part is about static models, which are for generating static hypergraphs. And they are further divided whether they are created full hypergraphs or sub hypergraphs. And let me first uh, discuss the first category, which is a static model for full hypergraphs. And let me start with very simple models called the configuration model, which is which are introduced in this journal paper. Okay, so configuration models generate random hypergraphs that exactly preserve distributions of node degrees and hyper edge sizes. So here we have the original hypergraph on the left and a hypergraph generated by a configuration model on the right side. So if you look at them very carefully, you can see that the degree of every node is the same and the size of every hyper edge is also the same, right? And actually there are two versions of this configuration model. And let me start with the first one called hypergraph sub stop matching and the first step of this algorithm is to create a multi set so here uh, we have a set of nodes and you have to notice that the same node can appear multiple times and the frequency of each node is exactly the same with the degree of the node so for example v5 on the left uh, input hypergraph has degree 2 right it appears in two hyper edges so it appears twice in the multi-set on the right side. And we uh, consider each hyper edge and we fill each hyper edge by randomly drawing nodes from the multi-set. So for example, we consider a hyper edge of size three. So it has three holes, right? And the holes can be filled with nodes drawn from the multi-set. Right, so we repeat this process for every hyper edge, right? And but the problem is that if we are unlucky, uh, we choose the we draw the same node twice, and in such a case, a uh, hyper edge may contain the same node twice or more than twice. So in such a case, such a hyper edge is called a degenerate hyper edge, and it can be problematic if uh, the real world hypergraph doesn't have such degenerate hyper edges. 
So that can be thought as a downside of this method, hypergraph stub matching. And the limitation can be addressed by this another algorithm called pairwise reshuffling. So this algorithm is a little bit more complicated. So it first samples two hyper edges. So they are randomly drawn uniformly at random. And it is possible that some node appear in both of the hyper edges. So in this example, we choose two hyper edges, which are E2 and E4, and V4 is included in both of them, right? In such a case, we uh, copy them, I mean, we move them in new hyper edges, right? It's because they need to be included in both of the new hyper edges. And then the other nodes are randomly assigned to the uh, two hyper edges. So as you can see, uh, the sizes are exactly the same, but the combination of nodes in each hyper edge are kind of shuffled, right? So that's why this algorithm is called pairwise reshuffling. And in this way, we can guarantee that there is no degenerate hyper edge. And this process can be repeated multiple times. And then if we repeat this process uh, enough many times, we can guarantee that this is a random hypergraph, right? Like uniform random hypergraph. And these configuration models are proven to um, prove the, I mean, proven to preserve the degree distributions, right? That's how these algorithms are designed. And empirically, they also preserve average local clustering coefficients very well. So as you can see in this table, uh, the average local clustering coefficients in the original hypergraphs are very similar to uh, those in synthetic hypergraphs that are generated by the configuration models. Okay. So this uh, was probably the most simple generative models of hypergraphs, but they have limitations, of course. They are very simple algorithms. So in this paper, which was published in 2021, the authors proposed more advanced generative models, which, which produce more realistic hypergraphs. And as a baseline model, they consider a algorithm called HyperCL, which is another version of configuration model. And this one is even simpler. So here, uh, HyperCL fills each hyper edge with sampled nodes. And we sample nodes uh, with probability proportional to the degrees of nodes. And if we are unlucky and if we create a degenerated hyper edge, we just resample nodes again until we obtain uh, non degenerated hyper edge. And we repeat this process for every hyper edge. And as a result, we have a graph. And this a simple algorithm, uh, of course, um, preserves uh, the degree distribution of nodes well because how it is designed, but it is limited in reproducing realistic overlapping patterns such as those what we covered in the previous part of this tutorial. So especially it fails to produce highly overlapping hyper edges, which are very common in real world hypergraphs. So as you can see in the figures, we compare the number of overlapping hyper edges at each pair of nodes and each triple of nodes. And the green dots shows the result in real world hypergraphs and red dots shows the results in synthetic hypergraphs generated by HyperCL. And as you can see, in real world graphs, we have a lot of overlapping hyper edges, but in synthetic graphs generated by HyperCL, uh, we lack of such highly overlapping hyper edges. So in order to address this limitation, a more advanced algorithm called HyperLab, which stands for multi-level HyperCL, has been proposed. And the first step is to hierarchically partition nodes. So here we have three levels of partitions. And in the top level, all nodes are included in the partition, right? And the partition is divided into two in the next level, right? And each partition is further divided in the next level. But what you have to notice is that these partitions are purely random. So just nodes are randomly assigned to uh, this hierarchy. And the next step is to choose a level. And in this example, the second level is chosen. And then 
among the partitions in the same level, we choose one. And in this case, the second one is chosen. And then we create a hyper edge with uh, nodes in this partition. And as in hyper CL, uh, each node is drawn with probability proportional to its degree. And this process is repeated until we create uh, enough number of hyper edges. And uh, in this way, uh, we can create realistic hypergraphs, as we will show you later. And what is the design principle of this algorithm, Hyperlab? And the problem of HyperCL was that we lack of a lot of overlapping hyperedges, right? So the distribution should be like the distribution in green, but the distribution by HyperCL was like in red, right? And Hyperlab can create uh, like uh, highly overlapping hyper edges. And it also can create overlapping hyper edges. This is because Hyperlab generates hyper edges from groups of various sizes. And hyper edges from small groups highly overlap with each other. And that corresponds to the tail side of the green um, plots, right? And it also creates hyper edges from larger groups, and those hyper edges are less overlap with each other, and they correspond to the head part of the distribution. And as you may recall, another property of real world hypergraph is that uh, hyper edges tend to be more homogeneous, which means that they tend to, con tend to consist of structurally more similar nodes. And uh, Hyperlab is able to create homogeneous hyper edges because hyper edges from small groups are homogeneous with structurally similar nodes. And it also can create hyper edges that are less homogeneous. And such hyper edges are from larger groups and they are less structurally similar. So by creating hyper edges from groups of different sizes, uh, Hyperlab can create highly overlapping hyper edges, less overlapping hyper edges, like homogeneous hyper edges and less homogeneous hyper edges. And the remaining question is how we can select the level, right? So when we select the level for generating hyper edges, we use weights assigned to each level. And actually, these ways need to be carefully tuned to create more realistic hyper edges. And the question here in the advanced algorithm called Hyperlab Plus is how can we tune these parameters automatically? So, in order to tune these hyper parameters or parameters, uh, we would like to minimize this loss function, which is called HHD, hyper edge homogeneity distance. So in this case, we uh, have the distribution of hyper edge homogeneity from the input hypergraph. And we have the same distribution from the synthetic hypergraph when, and we would like to minimize their difference. So for example, here we have a cumulative distribution from the real world hypergraph, and we have the cumulative distribution from the synthetic hypergraph, and we would like to uh, minimize their difference and we would like to minimize the difference by controlling the weights assigned to the levels. And we minimize, we aim to minimize this loss function by a simple greedy algorithm. And we first create all the hyper edges at the first level. And then we remove some portion of the hyper edges and we create the same number of hyper edges from the next level. In other words, we replace some portion of the previously created hyper edges with new ones. And the portion is actually a weight, right? A, high, a parameter that we need to learn. And for this portion, we perform a greedy search. And then we repeat this process for the next level. We uh, randomly remove some portion of the hyper edges that are previously generated, and we create the same number of hyper edges at the same level. And we repeat this process from the top level to the bottom level until there is no improvement. Okay. So we evaluate Hyperlab Plus uh, using um, in various perspectives. 
And for each perspective, we compare the distribution from the input hypergraph and the distribution from the output synthetic hypergraph. And when we compare two distributions, we uh, use a measure called D statistics, which kind of measures the gap between the two cumulative distributions. Okay, and let me show you the results. So here we compare different hypergraph generative models uh, in terms of three aspects. So the first aspect, the first distribution is the distribution of density of agonets. And the second one is the distribution of overlapness of agonets. And the last one is the distribution of homogeneity of hyper edges. And for each distribution, we compare different competitors. So here, HCL, HyperCL, which I described is a baseline. And we consider additional baselines, HyperPA, HyperFF, which will be described later. And uh, here, rows correspond to data sets, and each cell corresponds to the distance from the ground truth distribution. And as you can see, HyperLab Plus uh, gives the smallest distance from real world hypergraphs in most cases. And here we have results for two other distributions degree of pairs of nodes and degree of triples of nodes. And again, HyperLab gives the best results in most settings. And we can see that in visually in these plots. So here we show the distribution, degree distributions of pairs of nodes and degree distributions of uh, triples of nodes. And green dots are from real world hypergraphs and red dots are from HyperCL and the blue dots are from HyperLab, which is the proposed method. And as you can see, the difference between rear and HyperLab plus is much smaller than the difference between rear and HyperCL, which means HyperLab plus provides more generates more realistic hypergraphs. Okay, then let me move on to the next category of generative models. Here, we still want to create a static hypergraph, but instead of creating the entire hypergraph, we want to create a sub hypergraph. And actually the problem that is considered in this paper, which is published in WWW 2022 is even challenging. So in the previous work, we were able to create the same size hypergraph that, it, that preserves the structural properties of a given hypergraph. And here we consider a more challenging problem. So we still want to preserve the structural properties of a given hypergraph, but we want the synthetic hypergraph is much smaller than the input hypergraph. So we want to preserve the structural properties in a much smaller hypergraph. And in this paper, the authors uh, try to tackle the problem by sampling a representative sub hypergraph from the input hypergraph and their proposed method is called MIDAS. And in order to uh, introduce this algorithm, we first have to define what is a representative sample, right? So two, let's say that we have two hyper, uh, sub hypergraphs and we have to be able to tell which one is more representative. So in order to answer that question, we consider 10 structural properties, which are basically what we covered in these tutorials. And they cover node level properties, hyperledger level properties, and hypergraph level properties. And some properties are defined as distributions. In such a case, we measure the difference between distributions from real hypergraphs and from like sub hypergraphs using the D statistics. And some patterns are defined as scalar values. And in that case, we measure the relative difference. And since different properties have different scales, we normalize them by considering their average ranking and average disease scores. So in this way, we can measure the similarity between um, the input hypergraph and a uh, sample of the hypergraph, right? And the authors first try very simple and intuitive approaches for sampling. So they can be categorized by two and node selection methods chooses a subset of nodes and then they return 
the sub hypergraph induced by the nodes. So here in this example, we have the input hypergraph on the left side and the red nodes are sampled and the sub hypergraph induced by the red nodes are returned as the output. And another category of the algorithms is called hyperselection methods and they directly chooses a subset of hyper edges as a sub hypergraph. And the first category algorithms, node selection methods can be, uh, uh, I, mean, they, I mean, there are four uh, sampling node selection methods are considered. And the uh, first one is very simple. We just choose nodes uniformly at random. And the second method, we choose nodes with probability proportional to the degrees of nodes. And in the third method, we perform random walks and the nodes that are encountered in random walks are sampled. And in the last method, we simulated forest fires and nodes that are burned by the forest fire are sampled and they are used to create sub hypergraphs. And we consider two hyper edge selection methods. And the first one is really, really simple. It just chooses a target number of hyper edges uniformly at random. The method is called RHS, random hyper edge sampling. And we also consider a method called TIHS, which extends a famous graph sampling algorithm to hypergraphs. And the main focus of this work is RHS, which is the simplest algorithm because it works surprisingly well. So that uniformly random hyper edge selection method preserves many structural properties surprisingly well including the distribution of intersection sizes, the distribution of hyper edge sizes, the, sizes, the size distribution of connected components, and the global clustering coefficient. Of course, the simple method has some limitations as well, and it derives weakly connected sub hypergraphs. So if you compare the degree distribution in the sample and the original entire hypergraph, uh, the degree of nodes is much smaller, right? And the density is much lower in the sampled graph, right? Despite these limitations, if we compare all these straightforward methods, still RHL performs best overall, right? But it suffers some limitations. And so the authors tried to enhance the simple algorithm to uh, address the limitations of it. And in order for that, they analyze how different uh, perspectives are correlated with each other. And they found that degree preservation, preservation of degree distribution is strongly correlated with the abilities to preserve other properties. So if an algorithm preserves the degree distribution very well, then the algorithm is likely to preserve other properties well. And especially if you look at the plus on the right side, the density and overlapness are highly correlated with the average degree. So if degree distribution is well preserved, and it is likely that the density and overlapness are also preserved well. And these three are actually the limitations of RHS. So the authors tried to um, enhance the algorithm RHS to, uh, especially they focus, to focus on better preserving degree distribution. Then because of these correlations between the properties, it is likely that other properties are better preserved as well. So uh, the problem of RHS is that it gives very low degree nodes, right? So in order to address the problem uh, in this proposed method, MIDAS basic, the authors prioritize hyper edges composed of high degree nodes in order to increase the degrees of nodes in the sampled hypergraph. So here we compare two hyper edges and the degrees of the nodes that compose the hyper edges. And the left hyper edge consists mostly of nodes with low degree and the right hyper edge consists mostly of high degree nodes. And in such a case, the uh, hyper edge on the right side is prioritized for sampling, right? And specifically, they consider the minimum degree of nodes in each hyper edge. So in this example, uh, the hyper edge consists of five nodes 
And among the five nodes, B has the lowest degree, which is two. And the probability that this hyper edge is sampled is proportional to the two to the exponent alpha, right? And here alpha is a parameter. And by doing so, we can prioritize hyper edges uh, of um, consisting of high degree nodes, right? And of course, if we increase alpha, we prioritize like hyper edges consisting of high degree nodes more, right? In such a case, the degree distribution in samples tend to be more biased towards high degree nodes. And what we found is that by controlling alpha very well, we can preserve degree distributions very well. So here we have uh, results from four weird hypergraphs and we show how degree distributions change by controlling alpha, right? And if alpha is properly controlled for each data set, then we can preserve the degree distribution very well, right? And uh, they provide the advanced version of their algorithm, which is called the MIDAS. And in this algorithm, they automatically tune this alpha for the input hypergraph and they use some patterns observed from real hypergraphs to tune this alpha. So the details of the algorithm will not be covered in this tutorial. And they showed that this simple algorithm called MIDAS uh, provides overall the most, representative, most representative samples in terms of both average rankings and z-scores. And it is quite surprising that the algorithm even performs better than um, MGS, which stands for Metropolis Graph Sampling. This algorithm, this family of algorithms directly optimize the sub-hypergraph to, uh, I mean, to maximize the performance metric, right? So even when we compare the simple method with this more complicated directly optimization methods, still MIDAS performs overall the best. And since MIDAS is just simple sampling, it is definitely much faster than such directly optimizing methods. Okay. And uh, so in addition to performing overall the best, MIDAS successfully addresses the limitations of RHS, which motivates MIDAS. So the degree distribution is well-preserved and the overlapness is also well-preserved. Okay. And let me move on to another category of generative models, which are dynamic models. So these models aim to create, aim to generate dynamic hypergraphs that evolve over time. So the first algorithm is called HyperPA, which stands for Hypergraph Preferential Attachment. And this model was proposed in KDD 2020. And this model is definitely largely inspired by the famous preferential attachment model for pairwise graphs. And the main idea of the previous model was the rich get richer, right? If a node has high degree, and the node is likely to be linked by future nodes, right? And in this model, the main idea is subsets get reached together. So if a subset of nodes, if a group of nodes appear in many hyper edges, then they are likely to be included in future hyper edges as well. So specifically, uh, they, um, in this model, a group of nodes appear with probability proportional to group degrees. So anyway, this is a dynamic model, right? So it should provide dynamic hypergraphs. So it uh, starts from a small hypergraph and nodes are added over time. And with nodes, hyper edges are also added over time. So it's a dynamic model and it starts from the hypergraph on the left side and it grows over time to the hypergraph on the right side. And this is the detailed procedure of the algorithm. Uh, the so here we have the current hypergraph consisting of three nodes, one to three. And here you can see the degrees of the nodes, degrees of the individual nodes, 
and also the degrees of the groups of nodes. So for example, the degree of a group two and three is one because there is one hyper edge that contains both two and three, right? And this is a dynamic model and a new node arrives and a new node four is added in this example. And in this case, we toss a coin to decide the number of hyper edges to add. And let's assume that two is chosen and we want to add two hyper edges. Then for each hyper edge, we toss a coin to decide the size of the hyper edge. And for the first hyper edge in this example, two is chosen. So we want to create a new hyper edge of size two. And since the new node four should be included in the hyper edge, we have to decide what I mean, we have to decide another node to be included in this hyper edge, right? And we choose the node based on the degrees, the degrees of individual nodes, right? And we choose one node with probability proportional to their individual degrees. So that is for the first hyper edge. And we have to create another hyper edge, which is a second hyper edge. And we again toss a coin to decide the size of the hyper edge. And in this case, in this example, three is chosen. So we create a hyper edge of size three. And in this case, again, node four should be included in this hyper edge. So we have to choose two new nodes to be included in this hyper edge. And in order to choose the two nodes, we look at the degrees of pairs of nodes, right? And we choose pairs of nodes with probability proportional to the degrees of the pairs, right? And in this example, three and four are chosen. Ah, no, one and three are chosen, right? And four is the new node and the new hyper edge contains one, three, and four. So great, so two new hyper edges are added, right? So the hypergraph evolves from the one on the left-hand side to the one on the right hand side. And since two hyper edges are added, the degrees of individual nodes and the degrees of groups have been changed, right? So the, we have to update their degrees and we repeat this process for a new node, which may be node five and for node six and uh, et cetera. And for the evaluation of this model, they uh, look at the degree distribution and other distributions at each level of multi-level decomposition. As you may recall, multi-level decomposition is a way of representing a hypergraph as multiple pairwise graphs. So if a hypergraph on the top is given, uh, we can obtain a pairwise graphs between individual nodes, pairwise graphs between pairs of nodes, and the pairwise graphs between a uh, subset of nodes of size three and et cetera. And as a competitor, the authors consider naive PA and naive PA fills each hyper edge considering only individual, I mean, degrees of individual nodes. So hyper in hyper PA, the proposed method, uh, the authors consider degrees as groups, right? But in the competitor knife PA, they consider the degree of individual nodes and they choose nodes one by one based on the degrees of individual nodes. And here they show the degree distribution at the edge level decomposition, which corresponds to the second um, decomposed graph in the figure, right? And they compare the distribution in the real world data and the distribution from the hypergraph, synthetic hypergraph generated by hyperPA, and the same distribution in the synthetic hypergraph generated by NIPA. And as you can see, uh, the difference between real data and hyperPA is smaller than the difference between real data and NIPA. That means hyperPA uh, generates more realistic hypergraphs in this perspective. And the difference becomes more clear if we consider higher levels. So here we consider the degree distribution in the triangle level uh, decomposed graphs. And the difference is even clear, right? The difference between rear and hyper PA is much smaller than the difference between rear and knife PA. So hyper PA wins again. And the difference is even larger if we consider even higher levels, right? And let me move on to another generative model in the same category. So again, we are considering a 
dynamic model for creating dynamic hypergraphs, and we want to create the entire hypergraph. And this model, which is called HyperFF, which stands for Hypergraph Forest Fire, is proposed in this paper published in ICDM 2020. And the main idea of the model is very close to how we build our collaboration networks. So let's assume that a new node is a new student in the academia. So how can this person uh, build his collaboration networks? So first, he have to start working with his advisor, right? So node W is the advisor in this example. And the advisor can introduce a new collaborator in his own network, right? So S is introduced to you. So you and S create a new hyper edge. And S can also introduce new like collaborators to you in her like own network, right? So this process of the spread of introduction is uh, expressed as the forest fire over hypergraphs in this model. So in this model, we uh, simulate a forest fire, which starts from the advisor, which is called the ambassador node. And the forest fire is spread over hyper edges. And the forest fire is a stochastic process. So some nodes can be burned and some nodes cannot be burned with some probability. And at some point, the forest fire ends and some nodes are burned. So here, let's assume that these four nodes are burned by the simulation. And then we create, this model creates four size to hyper edges with each of the burned node. Right? So this is the first step of this method. This describes how this model creates size to hyper edges. But in real world hypergraphs, we need larger hyper edges, right? So for each of these size to hyper edge, we expand its size to create larger hyper edges. And we expand each size to hyper edge by simulating a forest fire again. So we simulate a forest fire starting from each size to hyper edge and some nodes are burned and we create a larger hyper edge with the burned nodes. So here, as you can see, uh, the size of some hyper edges become larger, right? And as a result, we have hyper edges of various sizes. And surprisingly, this model successfully reproduces a lot of patterns observed in real world hypergraphs. So including degree distribution and hyper edge size distribution, but as you can see, these distributions are not exactly the same, but I'm saying that the trends are similar, right? So they both have heavy tailed distribution. And another property called intersection size distribution, singular value distribution, right? So the general trends are the same. So they are heavy tailed and skewed, right? And it also can uh, reproduce some dynamic structural patterns, including diminishing overlaps and increasing edge density, which are covered in the previous part of this tutorial. And it also can reproduce the shrinking diameter. But unfortunately, it is unclear how HyperFF can reproduce these many structural patterns. So it is surprising. But at least by simplifying this HyperFF, we can mathematically prove some properties such as heavy tailed degree distribution and densification. So in the simplified version of hyper FF, which will not be covered in this tutorial, uh, we assume that nodes have this hierarchy and the probability that each node is burned uh, is decided depending on the district, decided depending on the distance on this hierarchy. So if two nodes are distant in this hierarchy, then it is unlikely that the node is burned. If they are close to each other in this hierarchy, then it is likely that node is burned. So by making that simple assumption, we can actually uh, make the model a little bit more tractable and we can prove some properties. And let me move on to the last category of generative models. So here we want to create dynamic hypergraphs but instead of creating the entire hypergraphs, we focus on a subset of hypergraphs. 
So this is the problem definition. Given a subsequence of temporal hyperedges, how can we predict the next hyperedge? This is very similar to generate a new a next hyperedge, right? And the authors in this KDD 2018 paper, uh, they provide a model called the CRU model. And the CRU model predicts the next hyperedge based on three empirical observations, which we already covered in the previous part of this tutorial. And these are the three empirical observations. The first one is repeat behavior, which says that temporal hyperedges tend to repeat previous ones. And the next one is subset correlation, which says subsets of nodes tend to be correlated. And the last one is recency bias, which says that temporal hyperedges tend to be similar to recent ones. So this is a problem setting. So we have a sequence of hyperedges and we would like to predict the next hyperedge. And in order to make the problem a bit simpler, the authors assume two things. So they assume that there is an oracle and the oracle, I mean, tells the size of the next hyperedge and the novel nodes in the hyperedge. So novel nodes means new nodes that haven't appeared in the hypergraph yet. So they assume that the two information are provided by Oracle and they want to uh, predict the remaining nodes that fill the new hyperedge. And this is the initial step. So initially we only know the size of the hyperedge and novel nodes if they are, right? And they want to fill the hyperedge with nodes. And this model has two parameters. The first parameter is a recency weight vector and the second parameter is correlation probability, and they will be described in the later uh, steps of this algorithm. So the first step of the algorithm is to sample a hyperedge. And when we sample a hyperedge, we do not sample a hyperedge uniformly at random, but we sample a hyperedge uh, based on this recency biases. So uh, if the recency bias is biased toward recent edges, that is called recency bias in the previous pattern, right? And in such a case, we are likely to draw, we are likely to sample a recent hyperedge, right? So in this case, uh, E4 is chosen, which is the latest hyperedge, right? And then the second step is to copy some of the nodes from the chosen hyperedge. And uh, we actually toss a coin independently for each node. So here we have three nodes in the chosen hyperedge, and we toss a coin for each of the nodes. And in the case of head, we copy the node in the new hyperedge. And then the probability of head is the parameter, which is called uh, correlation, uh, subset correlation, right? And this actually controls the correlation between hyperedges because let's assume that P is one. So if P is one, all the nodes in the hyperedge are copied to the new hyperedge. That means these two hyperedges are highly correlated, right? So it is highly correlated, but let's assume that P is very small, like uh, slightly greater than zero, then it is likely that at most one node is copied to the new hyperedge then the correlation between these two hyperedges becomes smaller, right? So in that sense, P controls the subset correlation, right? And the remaining challenges is to fit these two parameters, correlation probability and recency weight vector to a given hypergraph. And the authors perform a grid search for P and once P is fixed, W, the recency bias, can be learned with maximum likelihood estimation. And let me describe the results. And here, uh, the authors show uh, how the likelihood of um, the, generative, the generated hypergraphs change depending on the uh, correlation probability. And what you have to notice is that the optimal correlation probability depends on the domains of the hypergraphs. So as you can see in the hypergraphs from the email domain, right? So large correlation probabilities are preferred, but in hypergraphs from the contact domain, um, correlation probability uh, close to 0 0.3 are pre um, preferred, right? And 
we can see the domain similarity in other domains, right? Like text domain and co-author domain. And here we show the learned recency biases, right? And these figures show that uh, the recency bias are learned so that recent hyper edges are uh, preferred. So more specifically, learned recency weights tends to decrease monotonically, and this agrees with the pattern called recency bias observed in real-world hypergraphs. Okay, then let me move on to two other models, and uh, they are proposed in this ICDM paper. And in the paper, two tasks are considered. And the first task is an easier one. And here they want to answer this question. Has the given echo network evolved reasonably? So this question is formulated as a binary classification task. And here the goal is to classify corrected ordered echo network and randomly ordered echo network. So if an ordered echo network is given, the algorithm have to decide whether this is correctly ordered or randomly ordered. So these algorithms are designed based on these four empirical patterns, which are described in the previous part of this tutorial, right? And then uh, let me skip the details of these properties. And based on these properties, for each ordered uh, ego network, they um, collect these six statistics. So these six statistics correspond to the four patterns, right? And then if they use these six properties, they show that they can classify randomly ordered echo networks and correctly ordered echo networks pretty well. And in some cases, the accuracy is close to one and it's smaller than one, but still it's much better than, than random guesses, right? So by considering the patterns and specifically the statistics from the patterns, we can um, classify like, a right order and a wrong order fairly accurately. And based on this task, the authors considered more challenging task. And here they want to properly reconstruct the temporal order of the given echo network. So for that purpose, they propose a local search algorithm that is used to iteratively update the temporal order. So the algorithm starts from a randomly ordered echo network, and they want to change the order of the hyper edges, try to uh, reveal the correct ordered hyper echo network. And this is the procedure of the algorithm. So they start with this randomly ordered uh, echo network, and we can change the order by swapping two hyper edges, right? And there are many possibilities and here we list all the possibilities. So here we only consider one step and on the right side, we list all possible orders that can be obtained by one swap from the uh, order on, on the left side, right? So there are six such possibilities. And from the six such possibilities, we choose ones, we filter ones with high fitness. So how can we calculate the fitness? The fitness is calculated by the model for the first task. So this model was the classification model, which can classify which one is in the wrong order and which one is in the correct order, right? So by using the model, which can we can calculate, we can estimate the probability that this uh, ego network is correctly ordered, right? So we can use the trained model for task one for measuring the fitness of a given order of hyper edges. So in this example, we use the model and only uh, three out of six are possibilities give uh, orders that are better than the previous one. I mean, with higher fitness than the previous one. And among these three ones, uh, we choose one uniformly at random for um, diversity, right? And this process is repeated multiple times, right? So we start from this pi four and we can consider one more steps and we again sample 
like orders with better fitness. So this process can be repeated until convergence, until we cannot find the order with better fitness. So that is one trial. And when we can repeat these trials multiple times, and as a result, we can obtain multiple orders. And among the orders, as the final output, we choose the one with the highest fitness. And so here we show the results. And here we compare these proposed methods with like random guesses or random methods. And as you can see, the accuracy is still far from perfect, right? But at least they are much better than um, at least significantly better than random guesses. So by using the uh, signals from the patterns, we can in some, I mean, at some degree, we can order hyper edges in a realistic way. Okay. But still, it's an open problem. And as you can see, the uh, accuracy is far from perfect. And actually, this was the last generative model that we cover in this tutorial. And uh, fortunately, like all the, conf all the generative models that we cover in this tutorial are publicly available. They are open sourced. And you can see the links here. And since this is the last part of the tutorial, let me conclude this tutorial. So we, in this tutorial, we introduced hypergraph modeling of complex systems. And hypergraph modeling provides a new perspective, which we call sets of sets. And by interpreting a given data as a hypergraph or sets of sets, uh, we can come up with new like questions that are overlooked in like, graph modeling. So as a result, we can reveal like more new structural patterns that are previously overlooked when we model the data as a graph. And for uh, pattern mining, we have uh, developed a lot of data mining tools, such as hypergraph motifs, right? And many of them are publicly available, fortunately. And in the last part of this tutorial, we introduce hypergraph generative models. And these hypergraph generative models shed a light on the why patterns occur. So they provide potential reasons of the structural patterns that we discovered. And they have other applications such as statistical testing, anonymization, and benchmark data generation. And what can be future research directions? I think there can be a lot of future research directions. And here I have a few of them. So we can um, extend our um, attention to directed hypergraphs. So in this tutorial, we limit our attention to undirected hypergraphs. But many data in the real world are modeled as directed hypergraphs. And some examples are chemical reactions. So we have some sources. I mean, source materials, and as a result, we have a new set of materials, right? And we can ask questions like, how do real-world directed hypergraphs look like, and how do they evolve over time? And I guess these patterns can also be used for hypergraph representation learning, right? Now we know which properties are important, right? Which properties are significant in real-world hypergraphs then we can aim to embed hyper edges or embed nodes so that these structural properties are well preserved, right? And um, we also can um, utilize the patterns for anomaly detection. Now we know which patterns are natural and which patterns are abnormal, right? So we can use this knowledge to identify abnormal group interactions. And of course, there can be a lot of other research directions. And the materials for this tutorial are publicly available. So if you visit this URL, you can find slides, you can find key references, and you can find hyperlinks to useful materials. And here are some references. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have.